Have you ever wondered who's challenging the tech giants of Silicon Valley in China? It's none other than the tiny country of South Korea. But what's the secret sauce behind their dominating tech industry? South Korea is one of the most connected places on the planet. Nearly every household is online. Nearly every adult owns a smartphone. And nearly everything is inspired by tech. South Korea's tech giants are household names worldwide, like Samsung or LG, among others. But how did it rise to become a global powerhouse in technology? According to Bloomberg in 2021, South Korea ranked as the most innovative economy, dominating international charts in research and development, value-added manufacturing, and patent activity. South Korea's tech dominance didn't happen overnight. It's a tale of innovation, determination, and strategic planning. So, let's find out more. Established as a republic in 1948, after more than three decades of Japanese colonization, the division of the country into two, and three years of fratricidal war, the country was in shambles. The country was an impoverished and predominantly agricultural state, with most of the industry and electrical power residing in North Korea. A devastating war with its neighbor in the early 50s led to years of slow recovery. The government decided to prioritize electronics and technology in the 1980s to turn the tide. The South Korean economy relied primarily on rudimentary agriculture and international aid from partners such as the United States. However, wait a minute, because suddenly that began to change. In a matter of a few decades, the government pumped a lot of money into future-proofing, spending billions of dollars building a fiber backbone to bring broadband to every school, office, and home. Conditions were perfect to create a small ecosystem for tech to flourish, helping the country overturn its entire economy in just one generation, transforming South Korea into one of the world's top 10 economies in just over three decades. Since then, this love of technology and electronics has grown on par with the country's economic rise. South Korea is today one of the richest and most technologically advanced countries in the world. We're talking about a world-class industrial leader. And it doesn't matter if we're talking about steel, cars, or ships. South Korea is even a powerhouse in semiconductors, the oil of the 21st century. But how did this happen? What exactly was done? General Park Jung-hee overthrew the government of his newly elected prime minister, Chang Myon, and installed a reformist military government led by himself. Park Jung-hee became the all-powerful president in 1962. His dictatorship had one obsession above all others, industry, industry, and industry. South Koreans doped the industrial sector to fatten it up as much as possible, while at the same time restricting imports. For the Park Jung-hee regime, virtually all available resources were directed to industries. The state supported companies to grow. In return, they had to invest and export as much as they could. The idea was that with strong companies and well-developed industries, wealth would eventually flood all levels of society. Looking to build a prosperous country, President Park implemented a five-year economic plan centered around supporting research and development. This resulted in the establishment of the Korea Institute of Science and Technology in 1966. The plan was to become a mega factory for the rest of the world while forcing South Koreans to consume their products in the domestic market. The government only gave a free hand to buy abroad those products that were needed by the national industries. The only thing was to boost exports so the state did practically everything they could. But not only did it provide cheap financing, but also a lot of fiscal and regulatory aid. For example, companies that exported had all kinds of benefits, like profit tax reductions, tariff exemptions, foreign currency loans, and even export insurance paid for by the state. And not only that, imagine they needed to build a new factory or a road. No problem, the state took care of the expropriations and everything else that was needed. It was an open bar in exchange for investing, producing, and exporting. Despite being a poor country heavily reliant on international aid, South Korea's industrial sector was boosted through strategic moves by the government. President Park's regime sought financing from countries like the United States and Japan, providing companies with artificially cheap loans. This led to a significant increase in foreign debt, which grew by 825% between 1972 and 1982. It went from about $4 billion to more than $37 billion. By the 1970s, it was clear that the government's investments in development were paying off. 
big corporations such as Samsung, Kia, Hyundai, or the Chebols, and local universities now could launch exciting innovations that would be affordable and accessible for millions, both locally and abroad. Borrowing wasn't just the only option. Diplomatic efforts, such as the Treaty on Basic Relations with Japan in 1965, secured grants and low-interest loans totaling $800 million, equivalent to over 20% of South Korea's GDP that year. These financial injections played a crucial role in fueling the country's industrial growth, despite its initial economic challenges. Giants like the Samsung Group, the Hyundai Group, and the Lotte Group for decades were tremendously favored by the state, while they manufactured practically everything. Samsung manufactured air conditioners, smartphones, televisions, microchips, and refrigerators. They even produced ships. For example, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, the Samsung Group alone still accounts for more than 10% of South Korea's GDP. Yes, I know it's crazy, but that's it. The Park government also depreciated their national currency as much as possible to make it cheaper to buy from abroad. And yes, I know what you're thinking. Why would he do that? Destroy wealth? Well, it had another effect that at that time was a priority for the dictatorship. It helped to export more cheaply. In a way, this functioned as a transfer from the pockets of South Koreans to the country's large export groups. The purchasing power of South Koreans was eroded in exchange for enriching the large conglomerates. Of course, that was not the only sacrifice. South Korean workers also had to deal with wage increases that lagged far behind productivity gains. Why? Well, to keep costs from skyrocketing at all costs. That explains why the Jebols became more and more influential in the national economy. They had everything going for them. And yes, I can imagine what you're thinking. What an unfair system. Well, yes, but at least they achieved one thing. They reduced poverty a lot. People stopped working in the fields and started working in factories, which, although they were paid badly, meant they earned more money than planting rice and cabbage. And so, while in 1965, more than 40% of the population was considered extremely poor, this percentage had dropped to about 9.8% by 1981. Yes, they did that, although this wasn't solely driven by industrialization. While industrialization played a significant role in lifting many out of poverty by providing jobs, social programs and initiatives like the National Basic Livelihood Security Act and Productive Welfare also contributed to poverty reduction addressing various societal needs beyond the economic realm. President Park Chung-hee's time came to an end when he was assassinated in 1979 by the director of the KCIA, the South Korean Secret Service, during a private dinner. The country remained under the reins of a military dictatorship until the early 1990s. The fact during that period, in terms of the economy, the 1980s and 1990s did bring about many changes. One significant change through the new leadership was that the country abandoned protectionism and foreign capital started pouring in like there was no tomorrow. And with the opening up, South Korean companies also had to invest a lot more in innovation. Thanks to its thriving industries and policies, South Korea went from being a poor country to joining the group of 20 leading industrial nations, known as the G20. Since the foundation had been set, even as the country transitioned from dictatorship to democracy, Government support for research remained a key priority for both parties, driving further growth. Fast forward to today, Korea's big companies still lead in research and development. In 2014, private enterprises contributed a whopping 49.2 trillion won out of a total 63.7 trillion won spent on R&D, with over half of that going towards basic research. According to Bloomberg, last year, South Korea drew a record amount of foreign direct investment in a sign of growing bets on its technology sector. About $18.8 .8 billion of funds flowed into South Korea in 2023, a 3.4% increase from a year earlier, with the electronics sector accounting for $3 billion of the total. Still, South Korea's tech industry faces a myriad of challenges and opportunities. Despite its leading in semiconductor manufacturing, intensified competition from global giants like China and the United States poses a significant threat. And what's the threat? They're relying a lot on imports, especially from big players like the US, China, and Japan. This means their supply chain is a bit vulnerable. 
meaning they have to diversify by investing more on sectors like AI, big data, and cybersecurity. The artificial intelligence market in South Korea is projected to grow by 16.94% between 2024 and 2030, resulting in a market volume of $15.32 billion in 2030. South Korea's tech industry will keep growing as it continues to maintain its model of funding and investing in startups and industries. Now, as we come to an end, it's clear why South Korea is such a force in the tech industry. From its strategic investments and unwavering government support in the early days to its relentless pursuit of innovation, do you think that South Korea's development model can be taken as a reference for a lot of other countries, seeing how they were able to change in just three decades? Let us know what you think in the comment section below. And thank you for watching this video to the end. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you won't miss anything new.